All right, the children are dismissed to Children's Church. If that's you, you know where to go. Dismiss our children. The rest of you, if you want to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 28 this morning. Matthew chapter number 28. It's good to be back with you today, but to be honest with you, uh, I'm not really back. I, uh, if I was a phone, uh, the low power mode would be on right now. Um, <laughs> I have, uh, I've got a lot going against me today. Uh, jet lag is a very real thing. Um, traveling across the world and resetting what night and day is, like switching them, that's tough. But then a week and a half later to come back and do it again is tougher, at least for me. And so it's, uh, it's, it's been, been tough. And then on top of that, um, on top of that, I caught something the last day that I was there. They, uh, more than anybody else in the trip, they worked me to death. I preached, I think, 12 times. I taught for 10 hours in the Bible college when I was there, and, uh, and my immune system was pretty low, and I caught something, and so I have been um, pretty, uh, pretty low power for the last day or so since we've been back. I feel like somebody took my brain out, put it in a blender, uh, spun it around, and poured it back into my head today. And so um, do the best that I can. I heard this morning that uh, Brother Matt talked a lot about Africa in his Sunday school class, and I'm, I hate to, to tell you this, but it's not going to get any better um, this morning, uh, and uh, the, they were going to do some kind of testimonies tonight and talk about it again this evening, and then after that, we won't talk about it anymore for a while, I promise, or at least I won't talk about it anymore. Um, I don't know, I can't control Matt, uh, but um, <laughs> Matthew chapter 28, if you guys are there, I want to just share some things on my heart, uh, a different kind of message today. If you're a visitor, this is not a normal kind of message for me, uh, but I just want to share some things that I, on my heart that I learned on my trip about missions. Uh, so what I learned on my trip about missions, and if you're in Matthew chapter 28, we're going to read a very, um, a very familiar passage of scripture, starting in verse 16, we'll read down through verse 20. It says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world, Amen. You notice that's the very end of the book of Matthew there. There's nothing else, right? This is Jesus' last command to his disciples. Uh, Jesus was about to ascend into heaven. We see that in Acts chapter 1. He was about to ascend into heaven, but before he did, he got all the Christians together, all the disciples together, and he gave them their marching orders. He told them what they were to be doing while he was away. All right? And he, he, this, is, this is our commission. This is called the Great Commission. Uh, it's found in four different places in the New Testament. It's found in Mark chapter 16, verse uh, 15 and 16, Luke 24, 47 and 48, and then Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let me read just one more of those passages, the one in Mark. Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16 says this, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. All right? Basically, this is the mission of Christianity. Uh, it, it's what we are to be working towards as believers. Until Jesus comes back, our job is to do what these verses say. Our job is to preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature, okay? And uh, to be honest, we're not doing a very good job of that part, all right? Every creature under heaven, every person on this earth needs to hear clearly that Jesus Christ came and took their sin on himself, that he died for their sin, that if they put their faith and trust in him, that they can be saved. Every creature needs to hear that. Everybody. Um, so we're commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're commanded to teach all nations. Nations does not mean countries. Nations means people groups. 
uh, I read a fascinating book once called American Nations. There's about 11 nations, 11 different warring people groups that have always made up the United States. Um, and uh, we are to, to, to try to teach and reach every nation, every people group on the in the world with the gospel. We're to baptize converts. Um, it's interesting in both of those verses that we read, it talks about baptism. Baptism does not save you. Nobody gets saved because they're baptized. All right? We're saved by faith. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. But it's interesting, the only person in the entire New Testament that we know that got saved but didn't get baptized is the thief on the cross. And if you're saved and you're not baptized, you do not have as good an excuse as that guy did. Right? Like he was literally nailed to a cross. What was he going to do? Um, but if you've never been scripturally baptized, then you are commanded to be baptized. It's the first step of obedience to the Lord. And then we're to teach those converts to observe all that Christ has commanded us. Basically, everything that we know, everything we know about the scripture, we're to be passing on uh, to the people that are converted. And listen, of all the things the church is about, this is the primary purpose of the church. The primary purpose of the church is carrying out this great commission. It's in the church where people are baptized. It's in the church that people are taught to observe all things the Lord has commanded. Um, it's what we see in the book of Acts. We see the church sending out missionaries to do this work. Um, throughout the New Testament, we see churches supporting the work of these early missionaries financially. And so what we're doing as a church in supporting missions is extremely biblical. Uh, it comes right out of the Bible. Now, I think most of you know this stuff. It's pretty basic stuff. Most of you know about missions, and you know about the Great Commission. Okay, it's Christianity 101. But what I'm going to do this morning is I want to share some things the Lord did in my heart over the last few weeks um, while I was in South Africa um, that made me think about the Great Commission in a new way, and hopefully, uh, hopefully your heart will be touched to think about it in a new way. All right, let's pray, and we'll get into this message. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help me today to uh, preach with power. Lord, I know that no matter how smart I am or how well I, I say my words, which, Lord, you know is not going to happen very well this morning, um, but I know that I am powerless to do anything and that you have to work in people's hearts. And, Lord, I pray that as we talk about these things this morning, you would burden people in this matter of missions, in this matter of evangelism. Lord, I pray that you'd use the word and uh, that you'd use uh, these thoughts, Lord, in people's hearts. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the first thing I want to tell you tonight, three, tonight, this morning, it feels like night. All right, first thing I want to tell you this morning is this. The need is great. The need is great. Okay? Um, we saw a lot of stuff in South Africa. We're going to hear about it tonight. We'll show you more pictures tonight. I mean, we saw animals... That's what everybody thinks about when they think about Africa. We saw the monkeys, the baboons on the side of the road. Uh, we saw elephants. Um, we saw beautiful landscapes, uh, oceans. We got to go on this one hike on a peninsula next to the ocean, and it was the prettiest place I've ever seen in my entire life. It was like Hawaii with better weather. Um, it was, if, if such a thing could exist, it was just beautiful. Um, we also saw poverty like you would not believe. It's unbelievable poverty. Um, people living in the tiniest tin shacks, uh, some without even roofs, um, power lines just strung here and there on tree branches. Uh, it's amazing people don't electrocute it every five seconds there. Um, just unbelievable poverty. There, there are consequences to sin, um, and the sin of racism in that place has left a deep, deep mark uh, on poverty. The biggest thing we saw was people. I mean, there are just millions of people. And uh, people with very little gospel witness, people that, frankly, no one was trying to reach. We went to this one township. I'll explain what that is in a little bit. But we went to this one township called Motherwell. And uh, this missionary there, Josh Sullivan, has started a church in Motherwell. And it was a wonderful church. There was probably over 100 in attendance for, I think it was a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night message. 
Okay, uh, it was wonderful. But there are 400,000 people that live just in that township, okay, um, just in Motherwell. And as far as we know, that's the only independent Baptist church and probably one of very few gospel preaching churches in that entire whole township. Um, that was one. There was dozens of them in Port Elizabeth, okay? Um, we could have 20 churches or 40 churches just in that one township, and they wouldn't be stepping on each other's toes. Uh, when, we, when we first went to Port Elizabeth, I actually had this thought, you know, I didn't know what to think, but we, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of missionaries in this one city, and uh, a lot of them working together. And I always thought that was kind of unfair, you know? Like, you've got uh, all these poor guys that go to Kenya or Malawi or someplace like that, and they're all by themselves, and here you have, like, six missionary families, and they're working together, and it's like, does this place need more missionaries? Well, having been there, they need a lot more missionaries. They need a lot more missionaries. Um, and that's just one city. Cape Town has five million people, and there are far fewer missionaries in Cape Town. They, they know hardly anybody trying to reach that place. Uh, they're sending students there. The students are saying, hey, where do we go to church? And the closest church that they can find is 45 minutes or an hour away from where they live. All right? Um, and if we're being honest, South Africa is one of the places in Africa with the most gospel witness. Uh, just north of South Africa is Mozambique. There's 40 million people that live there. There's Zimbabwe with about 20 million people, although like a million a day are going to South Africa. It seems like it, it's like the, the Mexico of... Uh, never mind. Anyways, um, uh, there's almost no one serving there. Uh, we have a missionary coming in April or May uh, that, is, um, that is going to Mozambique and uh, looking forward to that. And all that's just Southern Africa. I mean, there's a need everywhere. Asia is unbelievable. There's an unbelievable need for the gospel in Asia. South America needs the gospel. Europe needs the gospel. Listen, parts of the United States need the gospel. Um, Jesus said this in John 4.35. He said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. There's a great work that needs to be done. There's harvesting that needs to be done. Now, I'm not a farmer, and I get in trouble whenever I use farm illustrations because some of you were farmers, and it's obvious how little I know, Okay? But I do know this. Um, you have a short period where you have to get the harvest in. There's a small window where you have to get the harvest in. And some of you that are farmers, you work like almost 24 hours a day during that period. I mean, you're on your tractor, you're on your combine all day long, working all day long, because you need to get in the harvest in that one window of time when it's ready to go. In the old days, they'd give people time off of school and time off of work because everybody had to help bring in the harvest. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, look, the harvest is ready. The fields are ready. There's reaping to be done. We have to stop everything. We have to bring in the harvest. We need laborers that will bring in the harvest. It's all hands on deck. Church, there's a great need. There is a great need. Um, and you have missionaries come in here and they show you pictures, but pictures don't do it justice. Um, you can have people maybe show missions video, and maybe that mission video plucks your heart, but the faces on that missions video are just faces on a video. All right? Until you see face to face and you, you see where they live and the, the amount of darkness that's there and how little gospel witness is there. There's a great need. There's a great need. All right? So that's the first thing I learned uh, on my trip about, about missions. The second thing I learned, and the thing I'm most grateful for learning, is this. The gospel is powerful. The gospel is powerful. Everywhere we went in South Africa, uh, we saw the result of the gospel. We saw what preaching the gospel did. We saw churches that came up out of nowhere, you know, filled with, with smiling, happy people that were singing, uh, singing out of worship to Jesus. There, were, there was a, the last night that we were there, I was, 
uh, in a, a church, and it was the most um, kosa. That's not how it's said, but I'm not going to say it how it's said because it sounds weird when you say it here. Um, but uh, it was the most, uh, the most. Um, uh, it was the only place I, I wasn't able to just preach without an interpreter was in this church. And so they were all singing in Kosa, and I did not understand any of it. It just sounded like gobbledygook to me, you know. Um, but I, I um, asked uh, one of the men that was with me, I said, what are they saying? And he said, they're saying, uh, we worship you, Jesus, or we worship you around your throne. We lift your name up high or something like that. And I was like, you know, that's pretty good. I'm glad that's what they're singing. I'm happy to hear that. Um, you know, we saw people everywhere we went hearing the gospel um, and accepting Christ. I got to preach, I think, 12 times in 10 days. Last Sunday, I preached four different messages in four different churches. Um, it, was, it was wild. And almost everywhere I preached, people, people trusted Christ. Um, I, I wasn't, people kept telling me the number, but I was like, I, I don't want to hear this. But uh, there was, I think, 18 people that trusted Christ uh, from, from my preaching while I was there. And, uh, and these people were not, you know, like, just raise your hand, okay, you know, we're marking you down. Like, they were, they were pulled off and they were dealt with thoroughly uh, by very eager students, very eager counselors. Um, it was awesome. It was unbelievable. And, and uh, I'm going to say something weird here. As exciting as it was to see all these people come to Christ, um, that wasn't the thing that excited me the most. The thing that excited me the most was seeing what the gospel did with these people. Because um, I got to see uh, the results of the gospel in the lives of these people that had gotten saved in those situations 10, 15 years before this. Um, I got to, to teach in a Bible college there with about 18 students. And uh, my favorite one, his head got cut off in that picture. So, um, but I hope, I hope nobody uh, from South Africa is watching this. They probably are. They're probably all mad because they're like, oh, we knew you liked that guy the best. Anyways, um, I, got to, I got to preach there and teach there for, uh, for 10 hours or so. Um, 18 students, probably 15 of those, uh, came from the townships. Now, I'm going to tell you what that means, okay? Imagine the worst housing project in the United States, somewhere in St. Louis, somewhere in, uh, outside Chicago or Baltimore, uh, somewhere the police tell you not to go, um, where uh, crime and drugs are rampant, a place where almost every family is just single mothers, um, a place where just darkness seems to have a death grip. Um, I've ministered to some of those places in the United States, most of Christianity has pretty much given up on those places. That's the, that's the sad truth. Okay? Uh, very few people say, I'm going to go to the inner city and start a church. It just doesn't happen. Okay? Most of us have just like, like to pretend it's not there. Um, but the place where these kids came from is far worse than any American ghetto that you can imagine. Uh, and listen, God's word transformed them. God's word changed them. The gospel changed them. Uh, these kids in my class were some of the sharpest people I've ever met in my entire life. Um, they were hungry for the word of God. They were, they were coming to every service. I mean, there's like 10 churches there. And they were getting in taxis and going uh, all the way across, across the city to go to services to hear the word of God preached. Um, they were excited about growing up and becoming pastors and being examples. And listen, what God did is God took these kids out of the townships, out of the ghetto, and transformed them. Okay? God, God took these kids, and they were asking me questions about just deep, God, deep questions. Like, I've never taught a group of people to ask better questions than these kids did. Uh, they were asking questions about, uh, you know, assurance of salvation from 1 John, and um, who do we separate from, from the book of Romans, and uh, a couple of girls came up to me the first day, and they, they opened their Bible to Titus chapter 2, and they said, what does this mean, that older women teach the younger women? They're like, well, we don't know that many older godly women. Can we become those people and teach other people? It's just awesome. It was, it was amazing. Um, they're, they're starting to get married 
and start Christian families, and they're determined to be Christ-like examples in their communities. And as awesome as all the work that's been done there now is, I'm, I'm confident that the Lord is going to do even more through these young people. It's just going to snowball, all right? What did that? The gospel did that. God's word changes lives. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Um, God's word changes people. The gospel changes people. You know, I met some of the early converts there that are now pastors. There's this guy there named Pastor Sipo. By the way, everybody there is named Sipo. It's like John. Men and women. There, in that class, there was, I think, three Sipos, and one of them was a girl, okay? Um, and I, I had them write name tags uh, and uh, put them on their tables so I could call them by name, and I butchered every one of their names. And at first, I was calling them Sipo. That means disease. Sipo <laughs> means gift. Um, so I was calling these gifts diseases. Anyways, um, Pastor Sipo uh, was, was there. Adam went there like 20 years ago. And Adam uh, met Pastor Sipo when they were like both 19, 20 years old. And, um, and pa pa Brother Sipo was telling me all kinds of great stories of terrible things he did to Brother Adam. Um, it was hilarious. Uh, but anyways, but he's now a pastor. He's got like four kids. He pastors two churches. He's doing a great work there, teaching these kids how to preach. Uh, awesome. There was another man there, uh, Pastor Lubabalo, um, who just a wonderful, wonderful Christian men, wonderful examples, giving their lives to serving the Lord. Okay, and what did that? The gospel did that. That was not the course their life was headed down until they were encountered by the gospel. God's word changes lives. All right? Um, there's something else that I, never for, I saw that I'll never forget. There was this one church that we preached at there, only one church the whole time we were there, uh, that was considered a quote-unquote white church. Okay? It, it, had, it was an established church. Um, years ago, they were without a pastor, and they asked Brother Kevin to come in and be their pastor, and so he did for a while, in addition to the other things that he was doing. And you've got to understand something about South Africa. South Africa is 95% black, 5% um, white. But the 5% that was white had a death grip on the country and enforced some very unfair things up through the 1990s. Okay? Um, black people were not allowed to live in town, they were moved, forced out of town, moved into these things called townships, which are these just giant ghettos that were spread around the edge of town. And they, they designed these townships where there was only one way in and one way out. And they did that so that the police could come in and force and shut the thing down. Okay? Um, they, they, uh, the, the black people were not allowed to hold white-collar jobs. They were not allowed to work uh, in any kind of skilled labor. They were not educated uh, beyond the bare minimum. The entire society was deliberately designed to keep them down and to keep them, uh, keep them under control. And this isn't some conspiracy theory. Like, they wrote, it was like in the laws that that was the purpose of it. Like, you can read it. It's, they, they weren't even trying to hide it. They said that's what they were doing. And all this went on through the 1990s. And then in the 1990s, uh, you, know, you remember Nelson Mandela was, was uh, out of prison and uh, came to power and the blacks took control of the country. And frankly, a lot of things went downhill. Um, they, they, a lot of things uh, that were really nice were not really nice anymore. Um, and uh, they didn't have the skills because of the way that they were treated, they didn't have the skills that they needed uh, to fill some of the leadership positions that they had. And so you see this everywhere that you went in South Africa. The white people lived very, very, very well, much nicer than most of us live. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. They have 95% of the wealth in the country. But the, the black people that are 95% of the population, they live in uh, mostly poverty, um, but they have all the power. And, and so for the white population, you know, they feel like their country has been taken from them and, and turned to garbage. And the black people, they feel like they've been, because they have, 
been mistreated all these years. I mean, and this is not stuff that happened, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. This is stuff that was going on um, when I was in high school, right? And so as tense as, as relate, race relations are in the United States, they were, they're far, far worse in South Africa. And it's far, far more recent. Um, but I want you to see what I saw. Can you play this, this video here? This is the church that I, uh, that I preached in on Sunday night. <laughs> Do you see what I see there? Does that look like a white church to you? Um, in fact, when Brother Kevin took it over, it was 100% white. It's all white people. Um, but there were five different cultural groups in that choir. And by all worldly standards, they should hate each other. Um, but they don't. They love each other. I mean, these are people that the disparity in their lives is unbelievable. Uh, the, the prejudice that they have towards each other is unbelievable. And yet, they were a church. And they love each other. Um, in fact, the, 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 there are people there that are you know, doctors and teachers sitting next to people that lived their whole life in the slums. Uh, there were people there that were British uh, or Afrikaner, white Africans, and they're sharing fellowship and food with these Kosa black Africans. And that doesn't happen. That's not normal. Okay? There's nowhere else in that society where you see that going on. And you know what? It was like a foretaste of heaven. Because the Bible says that every tribe and every tongue is going to be worshiping our Savior someday. All right? But what did that? The gospel did that. The gospel did that. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11 says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Um, we got to see that in, in real time in that place, and I'm grateful, uh, always be grateful for that, for that example. All right, the need is great. There's a great need in the world. The gospel is powerful. And I'm grateful I went because I got to see the power of the gospel um, in a way that I don't know that I would have got to see if I didn't go. Okay? God is still doing amazing things in this world through the gospel. Now, I'm going to give you a third point and I'll be done. So number one, I learned in Africa the need is great. Number two, I learned that the gospel is powerful. Number three, I learned this. We have to work God's plan. We have to work God's plan. Um, here's a dark secret about the churches in South Africa. I've been told there are hundreds of churches, gospel-preaching churches in South Africa, that believe the Bible, preach the gospel, hold the same doctrine that we have, and they are only ministering to the 5% of people that are white. Um, they seem to have no desire to reach 95% of the population around them. I've been told that there are many missionaries that go there and only minister to the white people. They're like fighting over that small group of white people that are in South Africa. Um, and everybody has an excuse, you know? They'll say it'll never work. Uh, they won't listen to us. They're too far gone. And it's the same excuse that uh, American Christians have used for generations to, uh, to ignore the poor among us. You know, the same excuses that have been used uh, to basically ignore the inner cities in our country. You know, most of us, I, I told you recently, 80% of Mattoon, 80% of the population of our city doesn't go to church anywhere. Okay? Most of the people that you rub shoulders with in Walmart 
that you run into in restaurants, most of them don't know the gospel. Okay? They just don't. Um, and, and you can say, hey, you know, I think they're too far gone. I think that the opportunity is there. If they wanted the gospel, they could show up at any one of the 40 churches in town and hear it. Um, you know, if they, 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 they don't want the gospel. They just want to party and do their thing. But I'm going to tell you something. Those are just excuses. Those are just excuses for us to not believe in the power of, God, of the gospel and not do what we've been commanded to do. Um, the great work that we saw in, in South Africa happened because somebody believed the gospel was powerful to save and even save those people that were in the townships. And they went and they started sharing the gospel and God rose up churches. God changed lives. Um, they went and they taught all nations. They baptized converts. They started discipling them. They started teaching them. And now, in that one city, there's like a dozen churches. There's a Christian school. There's a Bible college. There's a, there's a ca Christian camp. And there's dozens of young people that are surrendering uh, to serve the Lord and start churches. You see, it works. The gospel works. But someone had to have the faith to work it. Right? And here's my fear. My fear is we're going to stand before God someday. And he's going to ask, who did you bring with you? Who did you bring with you? And we'll say, um, um, well, no one wanted to listen to the gospel. And he'll say, well, did you share it? Did you share it? Did you share it with everybody? I was talking to someone recently um, about cleaning their oven. And they said, uh, they were talking about how they've never cleaned their oven. I don't, I, I need to clean my oven really bad, okay? So this is where the conversation came from. Um, don't judge, okay? <laughs> so I just, it's just something we don't do as often as we should. And, uh, and they said, in joking, they said, I bought some oven cleaner, but so far it hasn't done its job because <laughs> they've never used it, right? Um, and so we have... We have something that's powerful. We have something that works, but are we using it? Are we sharing the gospel? Okay? The, the need is great. The fields are right on the harvest. Um, there are people around there that need to hear the gospel. The gospel is powerful. The gospel changes lives. God has a plan. But we have to work the plan. God's given us a great, the Great Commission. And we could say the Great Commission doesn't work anymore, but the Great Commission doesn't work anymore because we're not working the Great Commission. All right? Um, that, that's, that's the biggest thing that I took away from this. I was just, uh, just unbelievably touched by seeing God work in all these people's lives. And it's like you can't say that that, that can't work here. You can't say that that can't work anywhere because it's God's plan. It's God's plan. Let's read Matthew 28 uh, verses 18 to 20 again and we'll stand for invitation and prayer. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That is our marching orders. What part are you having in it? What part are you having in it? Let's stand together. My brother Hedrick, if you'll come and uh, close the service in an invitation song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the things that I was able to see this week. Lord, what a privilege. And Lord, I pray that you'll help me to never forget them. And Lord, help, uh, help me to... to uh, it, however possible, pass on um, that vision, Lord, to others. Lord, thank you uh, for the work that you're doing around the world. Thank you for these missionaries that are uh, just serving you, Lord, in faraway places. Lord, I pray that you'd just bless them. I pray that you'd be with the churches that we were in, and Lord, that they'd continue to grow, that you'd continue to start more and more churches in uh, more and more areas there, Lord. And Lord, help us to be faithful to the Great Commission here. Help us not to lose the truth of the power of the gospel here. Lord, 
help us to be faithful, to, to see everybody in our city, uh, everybody in our towns, hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.